It's never been easier to get on the water with Academy Sports and Outdoors. Stop by your local Academy store or online at academy.com today and shop fishing's top brands like Luz, Zepco, Abu Garcia, Shimano, and more, all at prices you'll love. Find the latest gear for making your next big catch with all new 2021 fishing combos, rods, reels, and more. And with Academy's wide selection of gear, great brands, and highly competitive prices, find everything you need to have more fun out there. Hello, and welcome once again to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. This episode is titled Winter Red Drum from the Surf. Winter Red Drum from the Surf, and I have the fortune of talking to Captain Noah Link of Noah's Ark Fishing Charters. Um, we're going to be talking to Noah about time of year, areas that he fishes. We're going to be talking about what to wear, Winter Red Drum. we got to talk about what to wear, and then we will move into tackle and techniques. So we got a lot to talk about so that you guys can have some success with Winter Red Drum from the Surf. My name is Gary Hurley. Gary Hurley with Fisherman's Post, and Fisherman's Post has been serving the saltwater fishing community since 2003. We've been bringing you fishing reports, fishing information, fishing tournaments, fishing schools, and now in this latest chapter of serving the fishing community, the Saltwater Podcast Series. And it is in the Fish Post Saltwater Podcast Series where we reach out to our captain and guide friends from up and down the North Carolina coast and ask them to share with us their insights, their knowledge, their experience to help you, our audience, catch more fish more often. And I also like to add in that the true goal isn't just more fish more often, but it's just to give you confidence, to give you information, to get you out on the water, to spend more time on the water with more family and friends more often. Um, normally in the podcast, this is where I say I am joined as I am every episode by my partner, my podcast partner, Billy Thorpe of Copilot Studios. And Copilot Studios is a podcast studio where you can, that offers podcast services. And I would bring Billy on, but Billy is behind the scenes. He is not on the camera tonight. I like to say, use your imagination. Why? I'm going to let you guess at why Billy, the other guy is not on camera tonight. So it's just me. And we're going to move through some information, but just to prove to you that Billy is in the wings and he is running the show, I'm going to say, hey, Billy, cue the how to watch, how to listen. I think he paused a little bit long there on purpose just to make me hang out there. So here is our slide of how to watch, how to listen. Billy does a much better job of telling you guys to please you know, visit these spots, whether you like to listen, whether you like to watch. We're in numerous podcast locations, and we also ask you to subscribe. We ask you to share. We ask you to help get out the word. You know, Certainly, we're not doing this purely for the numbers, but we do pay attention to numbers, and we love to see it grow. We're getting great feedback, and it feels good. We want to continue to do the podcast. So there's our slide. And then what we do is we transition. And again, Billy is infinitely better at this than I am. I'm going to struggle in this part, but we switch over to our sponsor. We like to thank our main sponsor, and that would be Marine Warehouse Center. And Marine Warehouse Center is getting busy, and they are reaching out to you guys for sales, service, and parts. They've got your needs. And we've got a quick video clip we'd like to play from you from Marine Warehouse Center. As you know, it's been a great year for boat sales. However, it's been really tough for customers to find boats in stock. We're the headquarters in Wilmington, North Carolina for Pair Customs, Sailfish, Sea Chaser, and Carolina Skiff. Our manufacturers are telling us the high demand for boats is going to affect 2021 inventory as well. So if you're looking to get a boat in the spring, you need to come sign up with us now. Yes, come sign up now. As the Marine Warehouse Center video clip says, it's going to be another busy season. There's still pressure on boats, so you want to get there now. You want to get on the list. You want to see what's out there. Or if you're looking to sell today, it's a good time to sell via Marine Warehouse Center. And again, they are service and parts and so much more with a location here in Wilmington, a location down Charleston Way. And you know, now is when I work off a of Billy and try to set up some kind of attempt at humor whether it's Emmett's New Year's resolutions, which I think I've played out 
so I'm going back to Terrell. You know, that guy is a hog for attention, man. He did not like when I left him to talk about Emmett's New Year's resolution. So I said, all right, Terrell, I'll go, I'll go back. I'll go back to Terrell's jokes. What do you got for me? And boy, did he have a beauty. What did the fish say? What did the fish say when the eel crashed his party? You can probably see where this is going. The more ray, the better. The more ray, the better, he said. And right now, Billy would be good. Hey, that's all I need, a little encouragement. I just need a little encouragement. Look, I smiled immediately. I was taking this all too seriously out here by myself. Hey, let's look at a fish photo. Let's see what we got. And there we are, a redfish from the surf. Now, that is not a recent photo. And as Noah pointed out, man, that is a tougher man than both he and I if it was a recent photo, but it's not. We are looking ahead to warmer weather. We're looking backwards on this fish photo, and we're looking at Bill McLaughlin with an overslot red drum that fell for a mud minnow while fishing from the surf on Oak Island. You know, We're going to be talking to Noah. We're going to be going further north today. We're going to be going Harker's Island. Beaufort is sort of his backwater area. But I thought a red drum from the surf appropriate. And I'm also going to tell you guys that even though Billy isn't here, I am going to do my best attempt at filling the spot of Billy's best takeaway. Billy's best takeaway at the end brought to you in this episode by Gary Hurley. But let's bring Noah out. Captain Noah Link of Noah's Ark Fishing Charters. I say out of Harker's Island, but he's all over that Beaufort area as well. That's his backyard. He covers it all. Captain Noah Link, welcome to the show, man. A pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Gary. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Yeah, man, we have a history of doing the fishing schools together, man. You're very dynamic there. I know active with your sponsors, and you told me about this fishing that you were doing. And I was like, man, I'm in. I One, I want to go. And two, I want to talk about it. So tonight we're going to talk about it. Hopefully soon we go. But it, as I set up, it's winter red drum from the surf. So you are a boat captain, but this is something you really like to do this time of year is winter red drum from the surf. We're going to talk about time of year, areas to hold fish, what to wear, tackling techniques. But before we get to that, before we get to your knowledge and insight, it is tradition on the Fisherman's Post podcast to ask our guests two questions. Are you ready, Captain Noah? Yeah, let's do it. Question number one. Why should anyone listen to what you have to say about a red drum? Well, um, that's a good question. <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, I've been doing this. I've been fishing for red drum since I moved to the area here when I was about, I don't know, 12 years old, something like that, 13. And, um, yeah, I've been fishing for them, you know, since I was really young, chasing them. And been running charters for coming up on 20 years now. And in this, uh, this winter time, I've been targeting these uh, red drum with, you know, myself as well as a couple of uh, captains, um, former captain and uh, one of my good neighbors, Charlie Brown. A lot of people will uh, remember him. Me and him both started doing this together probably 15 years ago, up and down the Outer Banks here and um, doing it on light tackle, trying different baits, things like that, you know, finding what works, where the fish like to stage up the best, what types of water, things like that, the best winds, tides to fish on. So yeah, I've been uh, I've been doing it a long time, and um, I don't know everything. I'm still learning, but uh, yeah, I, you know, I would say my advice is uh, at least worth a, a listen. All right, I'm on board, and I, I'll tell you what, man. If you're going to drop Charlie Brown's name, I was going to be, I'm going to have to fight temptation to turn this episode into telling Charlie Brown stories because I've got uh, some buttes, as does everyone that's ever met that man. But that's well, another podcast. That's not this episode. We're going to keep talking about Winter Red Drum and not Charlie Brown. But you do have to get through question number two. And as is tradition on the podcast, it is a non-fishing related question. And so here is my question. According to historians... And Bible, Bible scholars, which was bigger, Noah's Ark or the Titanic? I would probably, 
I don't know, but I would probably <laughs> say, yeah, you know, most people would say Noah's Ark, but um, I don't know, Noah's Ark. You know, I to be clear, and I'm pretty honest, I didn't know. I mean, I'm Googling this. I looked at your charter boat name. I'm like, how can I get clever? Titanic, <laughs> bigger. Everyone agrees Noah's Ark was about a third the size, a third the yeah. size of the Titanic. But let's get into the material, man. Let's talk about, because I am in on this, man. I definitely want to go fishing with you. I want to do this trip. I'm hot for it. Win a red drum from the surf. And we were going to start with time of year. And so I guess what we're going to do is zero in a little bit more than winter. What do you got for me as far as time of year? When I start fishing for these reds, um, we've pretty much figured it out that in this area now, and I'm talking, uh, say, Shackford Island on up to Ocracoke, we'll say. And um, I usually start finding them about mid-January real good. I might go out a little bit before then. Maybe I might go out the 1st of January, something like that. And I might catch a couple here and there in the uh, places that I, you know, that I normally catch fish and, um, Usually don't catch them good. They, have, they don't school up outside real tight till about mid January, late January, and it'll go on through mid March till the schools out there start to break up and, and migrate inside for the uh, spring and summer. Man, any idea why it takes them till mid January to move out there and school up? Like why, what, what the delay is, or what they're doing prior to schooling up out there? Most. In the end, you know, they're still going to be, you know, up until then, the water hasn't really been getting that cold in these last years. And um, they're still going to find shrimp, um, some finger mullets, mud minnows, crabs, things like that. There's still food enough inside for them to feed on. And, uh, you know, till all of that pretty much goes away, they're going to stay inside and, uh, and feed. Then they're going to move out. And uh, mostly what I'm finding the last six or seven years, I've always wondered what they really feed on out there. I mean, I know scattered fish here and there, but what I find a lot of is uh, sand fleas, real small little baby sand fleas. And, um, you know, I find that the fish, um, that's why I think why I find them in the rough water is because the rougher water stirs that bottom up and the sand fleas and the food therefore get stirred up as well. And they're, they're able to feed, but that's where I tend to find them is, you know, in the, on the points, the uh, places where, you know, where it's a little shallower and it's breaking more, you know, as far as the surf goes. So by shallower, man, I'm, I love specifics. By shallower, what are you talking about? Like, you know, you might have a a, a sandbar, you know, that, that makes out and, you know, it might be two feet deep going out and that's where it's breaking. And you can tell because, you know, right beside it is where that wave is just going to kind of peter off and, and die out. Um, but... I tend to find the fish right along the edges of those sandbars and on the sandbars where the waves are really breaking. You know, I don't find too many schools in the, in the deeper sloughs, if you will. I, I target the rough places. So if it's a pretty day, you're not hot for the red drum fishing, or what? it doesn't even matter if it's pretty or not. It's really just wave activity. Right. Um, the way our beaches face here, I do better, and everybody's different, but I do better on a northeast wind with an incoming tide. Um, you know, but it could be different, you know, down your way is, is the northeast wind's going to act differently because the beach faces differently. Um, so that's you know that's the conditions that i'm looking for and uh to get those conditions you know sometimes i gotta wait weeks to get the wind right and the tide right any thoughts but, on why it's an incoming tide improved bite 
what any the theory on that? Three, the only theory that I can come up with is as that tide comes in, like when the tide's real low, a lot of these uh, sandbars and points and things are exposed. As it comes in, you know, on a full high tide, what was exposed at low tide might be three feet deep at high tide. These fish are coming in and feeding on that, you know, on that high tide push. And they'll usually feed, you know, and this is, this is on a normal basis. I'm sure that there's times that I've caught them on the falling tide, but usually that's when I'm going to find them. And I'll find them biting. They'll bite good on into the, about an hour into the fall, and then they'll quit. Um, just like all fish, you know, when they're done biting, they're, they're done. When they're done feeding, they're done feeding. You know, it's uh, kind of like us at uh, lunchtime. Once we've eaten lunch, you can put food in front of us. We're just not hungry. I, I follow that analogy. I can identify with that. So as far as areas that hold fish, and I like that you're already thinking like your way versus down my way. What, what else can you tell us? I mean, you've already started on it. I think you said on sandbars, next to sandbars, the shallow water wave activity. Right. But for, for someone that isn't necessarily fishing your backwaters, or maybe they are, give us a little bit more so that we have confidence we're picking a good place to at least try. Okay, like, um, okay, say you're going to fish uh, Shackleford, Beaufort Inlet side. You're going to want to get, like, right on the, at the inlet where the point is, or maybe down the beach there might be a point that makes out you want to get where the, where the wave action is, even if you got to wait out a little bit, you know, I mean, I, sometimes I go out waist deep and, um, something that, uh, you know, that, that need to think about is what we're fishing with the baits. I'm not throwing soft baits or anything. What I'm throwing, I got to be able to cut through a wind. I'm throwing metal. Um, basically, um, my, my favorites are, uh, if I can get them unhooked here, my favorite things to fish with are these here. I'll put it up by the screen. It's a Clark Spoon Shad Jig. They come in a uh, multitude of colors. If I can get Other it way. on the screen <laughs> there. Um, I'm fishing. I'm throwing these as well as... Uh, those. Another good metal ones to throw are the uh, Sea Striker Surf Spoons. They come in uh, gold as well as silver. Right. You're doing, I, could, I give you a C minus. I know, right? But um, anyway, these metal jigs right here. I've thrown all kinds of stuff to these fish over the years. And when we're thrown into a Northeast wind, you got to have something that'll get out there. So if you're throwing, you're trying to throw a regular, you know, even a half ounce jig head on a soft bait's not going to cut it. I come across a lot of people fishing the beach and um, they can't get out far enough, you know, this will cut through the wind, it lets you get out and and reach the fish where most baits won't. You know, you need to be able to at least throw 30, 40 yards and throwing a soft bait into that wind isn't gonna cut it. So what's your uh what's your go-to rod and reel setup when you're doing this type of fishing? What I'm using, I've got these right here. Um I've got several that I'm uh, that I'm using. My uh, my go-to that I pull out each time is going to be this one here. This is a Star uh, Plasma. Seven foot. Seven foot. This is a fast action, six to 14 pound. It's a really, really fun rod. 
And, uh, you know, like most people equate surf fishing with your 10 foot surf rods and putting it in a uh, sand spike and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, here we got our chest waders on and we're out there in it. You know, the waders aren't to keep you dry. They're just to keep you warm because you're going to get wet. Um, I am anyway, in my case, I, I get out there in the water, but this, uh, the seven foot is a pretty, uh, common size rod. Um, but I like the, this rod has got really, really light and a super fast action. You can fish all day with it. It doesn't wear your arms out because you're going to be doing a lot of casting. Now, if I want to really reach out and, uh, get to uh, get some distance. I've got an eight foot star sequence rod right here. It's got, you know, the different colors on it. But um, this, this rod has a, a giant parabolic bend in it. In other words, the whole rod, when you hook up, and a lot of these redfish, they're going to be upper to over slot. They're going to, a lot of them are going to be that 23 to 25 inch on end of probably 30 to 32 inches. This rod right here, unlike the seven foot rod, it, the real fast action is up towards the tip, and then it's going to have the backbone in the back. This rod, the sequence, the whole rod will bend and load up. And you can really handle a really good size fish on this rod. It's very similar to like a fly rod. You can handle a big fish on a small fly rod because the whole rod bends, loads up. So when and like I say, with eight foot, you got an extra foot of casting. You can really sling something out there. But um, this uh, you know sometimes they're a little further out. Then other times, you know, um, I don't go out there right to start with every single time and find fish. Sometimes we do. Sometimes it's first cast and we're hooked up. Um, I've got the places that I, you know, over time, I've pretty much honed in on where these schools hang out in the wintertime. But sometimes they might be 20 yards off and sometimes it might be 45 yards off. So, you know, sometimes I might have to come back over and uh, pick up this this eight foot rod, you know, and put up the seven footer, um, which brings me to the case. Um, what I do is um, to carry all my gear. I have a uh, beach cart, basically it's a sea striker beach cart with the rod holders. So I can put all my rods in, tackle bag, cooler, everything that I'm gonna need, I can offload on the beach and that way I don't have to carry much. I carry everything in that car. And that's a, that's a big deal because toting things up and down the beach, tackle bags and this and that is, uh, can be tough. So it's nice to have that cart. I can pretty much put it where I want to. And I have all my stuff, just a, you know, a nice little station. And, uh, you know, I, I always have a, pretty good size tackle bag here and um what this does i can unzip it i got tackle stations all in here up top i got plenty of room for food all that kind of stuff it's definitely something to think about when you're heading out in the coldest part of the year with really cold water you want to have plenty of extra clothes food water you never know when you're going to get stranded out on one of these islands. And I can promise you this time of the year, you're, you might see somebody out there, but most of the time you're the only one there, you know, it's you and whoever you brought with you. So you want to, you want to make sure you got enough stuff in case you get in a bind to uh, not get in trouble. Well, let me, um, I'm going to circle you back to the rod. Our simple question, mono or braid and what size? I I'm using 15 pound fins braid, fins wind tamer is what I use out there. The leaders, I'm using 30 pound uh, 
P-line fluorocarbon. I use, I go up to the 30 pound because these reds, you know, they got that, you know, it's like 30 grit sandpaper for a mouth and they'll wear through a, even if you're using a 15 pound fluorocarbon, they'll wear through it. So I go up to that 30 and I don't have any problems. And how long of a meter you like? I'm using a few feet. I'll start out with about three feet. Um, mostly because when, when you, when I'm coming in in the surf, I've got gloves on and everything and you, you don't want to raise your rod tip too high trying to get to that fish. You want to break your rod tip, sticking it in the air. So if I got a three foot leader, I don't have to grab a hold of braid. I don't like grabbing braid myself. It just, you know, it's tough stuff. It'll cut through gloves even. So that leader gives me, that long leader gives me something to get a hold of and I can drag the fish ashore or at least get a hold of him where I can, you know, pick him up, whatever. But, uh, also, it gives you, you know, if you want to switch leaders, you got long enough leader there to cut cut one off and add something else. You don't have to be uh, changing leaders every time. You've got plenty of long leader there. All right. And I, here's what I, I want. And I'm also circling back around to, you know, finding these fish or where you're likely to find these fish. So I totally get that you have your spots that you have historically found them and, you know, you've patterned them through the years. But if I had brought you down here, if we were going to do this trip for an article and I brought you down to say Pleasure Island where you're not familiar and we right. walk out on that beach we walk, and we got our cart. And so we're mobile. I get it that we're mobile fishing. We're not sand spike fishing. We walk out on that Pleasure Island beach. What are you where are you looking? What are you looking for? Help, you know, help us all by telling us how you would scout out a new spot, not something you had already patterned. Well, first thing I would probably look for, like I said, is, uh, where, where are the waves breaking the hardest? Where are the biggest waves breaking? You know, it's always going to be a place where, you know, it's going to be rougher in this spot than it is 25, 30, hundred yards away. And I tell you another, uh, advantage that um, I have figured out in this digital age is you can go on Google Earth and scroll right on into the beach where you're at and you can see the shallow spots and the deep spots. You can find the sandbars. You know, I found plenty of places like that. So that's something to think about, you know. You can and there, how about the waves breaking people. basically close to shore, man? Am, am I finding my red drum like right in right off the I, beach or is it usually that sandbar that gets that first round of break most people can't reach the outer bar on a regular beach i know what you're talking about is going back to my uh surfing days the outer bar is usually hard to reach and you're going to have a deep trough in between the beach and that that that's why like at low tide the surf's going to be breaking on the outer bar high tide it's going to be deep out there. The surf's going to be breaking up near the beach. And that's what you want. High tide, they're going to be behind the breakers along that beach, on a, on a normal beach. But like out here, say Cape Lookout, um, you got Cape Point. You know, same like uh, Cape Hatteras, Cape Fear, Fear down your way, same thing. There, there's always a point out there on the Cape. And it's there's always wave action out there. I mean, on these... It doesn't matter what the wind is. If it's a slick, calm day, you're still going to have some wave action there. And um, those are the types of places that I'm hitting. Inlets, you know, um, the points on the inlets. And um, like I said, just, you know, and sometimes you just got to, maybe you get a rough day and it's just rough everywhere, which happens all the time. And you might have, say, you got four guys with you. You know, what I do is I tell people, hey, let's scatter out. Let's cover 150 yards of beach here. And whoever hooks up first, a couple fish, everybody gather in. You know, that's where the school's at. You know, a lot of times you, you have to do that. You know, like I said, a lot of times you don't hit them right on the head first cast. You got to find them. You know, they might be within a normally be within a, a, a 50 to 100 yard area but you still got to find them you know they're not going to come right to you 
So if I'm throwing if I'm throwing those two one of those two different pieces of metal you showed me, right. what's the action there? I throw it out there as far as I can. It hits the water. I flip the bale, and then what I'm bring doing, it in slow and steady. Get walk me through technique. Well, like I said, this is a uh, one of my favorites right here. Man. All right. C, not C minus, a C. You're going to throw, it's a Clark Spoon Shad Jig. Works really good. I've thrown and caught these drum for years on a lot of different types of baits, but I've never caught them as good as I do on that one. And the action that I'm using is basically like what you would fish for uh, trout fishing. You know, you're, let, you're throwing that metal out there and you're going to work it up off the bottom and let it fall and work it off the bottom and let it fall just and uh and they'll hit it they hit it hard but i you know i always tell people let them hit it and take it let him get his head turned before you set the hook he'll pretty much do it for you because this time of the year you know if you're uh if you're eating breadcrumbs and somebody comes along with a hamburger, you're going to go for it. And uh, that's pretty much the case. You know, there's not a whole lot of bait running up and down that beach out there right now. And you start putting those in there, they'll go feeding hard. Um, you know, I've had a lot of people out there who can't believe that they hit that metal like they do. But um, I've literally been out there with guys fishing cut bait and shrimp. And we'll outfish them with the metal jigs. So they, they really do work good. They're great for casting. Um, you can hit your mark with them. Just, uh, and you, you know, like I said, you work it just like you would uh, trout fishing. You work it slow, you know, working it off the bottom and letting it fall. That's it. They'll pick it up. Man, uh, so how about this? Like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm your guest. You've got me out there. You're trying to put me on fish. I'm a client and I am fortunate enough to find that fish and I've got it. How do you coach? How do you coach the new person on getting that fish from the water up onto the beach for my photo? You know, what, what are the mistakes that people make? How do you guide them to make sure they don't mess up right at the end? What I usually tell them, and this goes back to having that long leader. I put the leader, like this on everything and i do carry some people out there to do this um the people that i do carry take out there um i make sure that they are going to be that they're in good physical enough shape to handle being in the surf knocked around that sort of thing that's something to think about um you uh you don't want to get out there and, and, and have an accident with this but um what i tell them to do is look you know fight this fish slowly back up as you get him into the within 20 yards of you just start backing up and as you get him if you get him to where you can get the leader just drag him up on the beach but always keep pressure on it um you don't want to give just like any fish you don't want to put slack in the line because he might just be lip hooked or who knows you know you don't you know if you don't want to lose him um yeah i just tell him to drag him up on the beach Myself, I usually keep a pair of uh, grips on on me, but not everybody's quick enough to do that in a surf. And um, and uh, you know, I always keep a pair of pliers on me too. So a lot of times, you know, sometimes I'll go over and just grab them for them. But uh, most of the time, you're going to see people drag them up on the beach, just like they always have. You know, it's really the only way to do it trying to uh, unhook a drum, trying to get him in your arms in the surf and unhook him, um, even if you're going to release it, is hard to do. And, you know, you're liable to end up with a with a treble hook or a, a hook in your finger. And uh, there's no need in that when you can drag him up on the beach and unhook him and, uh, you know, either put him in the cooler or stringer or release it. Okay, so, man. So, yeah. Just dragging them up on the beach. That's that's the most safest thing to do, for sure. Um, I feel like we've covered this topic pretty good, but I always like when we're coming to the end, like to just say, hey, hey, Noah, what else, man? What did I not set you up by asking a question? What else comes to mind? 
you know, that someone wants to try this out and have the best chance for success. Anything, anything else to share that I didn't set well, you up to say? I'll go, I'll kind of go over it quickly from, from leaving the dock to being out there. Um, you want to prepare for this well. You want to go out. I mean, if you're going out for the first time, go out when it's halfway decent. Don't go out when it's 45 degrees and, and you know, figure out your wind, but go out on a decent day. But, like, what I do, I tell people, you're going to have waders on. Don't wear jeans or sweatpants or anything that really holds water underneath your waders. Wear something that is you know, some under armor and a pair of pants that are moisture wicking, some outdoor pants and, you know, things that if you do get wet, you can go up on the beach in the sun, peel your waders down and you'll dry out really quick because the material's not holding water. Um, if you're out there with jeans and a sweatshirt on, you're going to be cold all day long. You know, take extra clothes, extra food, for sure. Any tools that you uh, might need, make sure you got tools, you know, pliers, scissors, knives if you need them, whatever you might need. Because like I said earlier in the program, um, you never know. You might get out here on one of these barrier islands and either stay too long and your boat gets aground and you can't leave, or maybe your motor doesn't start. But um, anyway, just Take good precautions because this time of the year is nothing to play around with and make sure you're in good physical enough shape to get out in your waders in the surf and get knocked around enough to where if you do get knocked down, you're going to be able to get back up. Um, had it happen to me plenty of times, you know, don't see a wave coming. So like I said, the waders aren't to keep you dry. They're to keep you warm, you know, and uh, if you do get really wet, don't take your waders off leave them on, you know, unless you have dry clothes to put on or something. So just, uh, it's the kind of fishing where I, I want everyone to be safe. Um, I've had to tell some people that, that I wasn't going to take them out. So, um, so I know, uh, I know how beat up I can get and I'm not saying I'm in the best of shape, but I'm in pretty good shape for my age. And, uh, it, it takes a toll on me even so. But, uh, you know, it's fun. I'd say go with some people, take some people out there. So there's, don't go by yourself this time of the year. It's, you know, not a safe thing to do. But uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's great fun. If you do it right, take the right stuff, prepare right. To me, it's some of the most fun fishing of the year. You're uh, usually by yourself, maybe a few friends, but it's... Uh, it's just a great thing to do this time of the year, especially with everything that's going on right now. Um, it's something to do outdoors, you know, not around everybody. So it's well, uh, well, just a great time. So Noah, as we sort of touch base before the show, man, I, you know, you are active year long. I mean, Noah's Ark is busy. You're constantly taking people out throughout the year. And so give me the highlight reel, you know, just the highlight reel, but what are you, what are you looking forward to for the spring? What do you transition into the summer? And then what does your fall look like for Noah's Ark fishing charters? Well, this spring, um, these drum are going to be biting until about uh, mid March and then they'll start to uh, disperse. And I really won't have too much here for maybe a month. You might see some, it depends a lot on the temperature and the winds in the spring but lately last few years our first uh, fish have been blue fish coming in right around about the first or second week of april and uh, they're usually pretty nice blue fish um they show up overnight one day you don't have anything the next day you're covered up with them they're usually in about the two to five pound range and uh personally i'm really ready for them to be here by then and um they're a ton of fun to catch a lot of different ways. Um, you control for them. I love to cast to them. You can throw metal, all kinds of stuff. I love to uh, throw top water plugs to them. Shortly after that, a couple of weeks, 
um, as the water temperature gets, uh, you know, in that 68 to 70 degree range, you're going to see some really nice spring Spanish mackerel start showing up off Cape Lookout. And also, you know, around the Beaufort Inlet area, they're going to be showing up really good. And the first ones to show up on the Spanish mackerel are going to be really, you know, they're going to be good sized fish. And uh, you're also going to see the Atlantic Bonita show up then. You know, if they're going to be here, they're going to be here then. They're going to be mixed in with the Spanish. You know, they're going to be usually in that 40 foot of water range around some of the near shore wrecks, things like that. And, uh, you know, for those that don't know, the Atlantic Bonita is an actual tuna. It's one of very few that has no size limit or catch limit, and they are outstanding, very similar to a black fin or a small yellow fin. So they're great to eat. Uh, moving on into May, you're going to see um, the cobia migration, you know, from south to north. They're going to be moving up to uh, spawn, and um, that's always great to get in on some of that action. And uh, the the big chopper bluefish, the ones, you know, the 8 to 15 pound fish, they're going to be moving into the flats areas to... Um, to spawn and feed as well and uh, they usually come in and leave with the cobia which is usually around if they're going to show up and leave they're going to usually leave around say the first week in june somewhere in that area the majority of them anyway and um, then you're pretty much looking in the summertime and you're going to have you know we don't know what the regulations are going to be coming up but you're going to have the flounders moving in in may and june they're going to be coming from the offshore wintering grounds and uh, they're going to be moving inside to the local you know rock jetties marsh areas things like that and uh, that's going to be on of course in the summertime you're going to have the bluefish spanish pretty much all summer um in the summertime the blues and spanish aren't usually as big as they are in the spring and the fall but uh you know, summertime, what I call a summertime special is, you know, your Spanish, your bluefish, and your flounder in this area. Um, we will be picking up in the summertime the red drum as they migrate back into the marshes to feed. Um, in this area, they tend to scatter out. They will school up some, but a lot of what I catch in the summer as far as drum go, um, it's going to be, you know, one to four fish in a spot. Um, and you might Noah, you're going to pick up. You're going yes. to have to move me into the fall, man. I needed a high. You're, I mean, this is educational, but you got to take me to the fall, man. You got to get, you got to right, highlight right, me right. more highlight and less detail. It's great detail, but um, we're at the end. Move, moving into the fall, we got starting around October. The big Spanish are going to move in again. They're going to come from offshore to come in on that last feeding frenzy as all the bait starts to move south. And uh, once they move out, you're going to have the flounder moving behind them. They're going to be moving out as well. They're going to be good size. All these fish are going to be good size. Then coming in to like November, December, the speckled trout bite and the redfish bite in the inside waters, back in the marshes, shallow waters, around the creeks, oyster beds, things like that, is going to be red hot. It's uh, That's where, you know, all your mirror lures, soft baits, popping corks, all that stuff's going to come into play, and um, it's going to be great. And uh, after that, We'll circle back around to the uh, redfish in the surf. Right on, man. I appreciate it. it. I mean, I know you got a lot of fish. I know you're from a fishy area. I know you had a lot <laughs> going on. And I appreciate yeah. you talking to us about winter reds, man. I am. I'm excited for this trip. I know we've talked about it. I hope those conditions align and we find our way out there. But now that I know that you're full of Charlie Brown stories, I mean, <laughs> blue fish, red drum, I don't care what we yeah. fish. I don't care what we fish for, man. I love telling a Charlie Brown story. So I'm coming well, your way. Put me on your calendar somewhere. And thank you for talking to us, man. Thank you for being a part of this podcast episode. I had to bring him up because he was my neighbor for a lot of years. And we, uh, you talk about stories, I've got them. But, uh, well, good. 
I know I get into some detail a lot of times, but um, I appreciate you having me here on the show tonight. And, uh, you know, great talking with you. I hope I got a little bit of, uh, you know, material across to some people. Uh, if anybody's got any questions, they're welcome to hit me up, um, you know, Facebook Messenger, text, website, whatever. So. Well, right on, Noah. I think they will. I think they will. I think you've hit a topic that people love. I mean, this time of year, I can't think. I mean, it's one of the top fisheries. I think this time of year, good for you, man. Yeah, it is. It's it's a it's a ton of fun. You're starting to see more of it. More people get uh, fishing year round. So, it's a uh, it's definitely up and coming for sure. Noah, thanks again. And now I'm turning to Billy and saying, man, I'm going to wrap up and remind you guys to again to subscribe to share. You know, whether you're a listener, whether you're a viewer of the podcast, and please support Marine Warehouse Center. Marine Warehouse Center, you know, they don't they don't just have a boat shop, boat dealership, supply store, and they actively look for ways to be into involved in the fishing community, whether it's the Fisherman's Post podcast, Fisherman's Post events. They want to be part of the fishing community, not just serve the fishing community. So please check out Emmett Terrell, the whole group there. And as far as Billy's best takeaway. And I'm not really sure where to go with Billy's best takeaway, but I think what stuck with me more is is Noah telling me that waiters aren't to keep me dry. They are to keep me warm. I think that is one of the thoughts that I'm going to mull over. I don't know if that makes it for a good advertising campaign for waiters. We don't keep you dry. We keep you warm. But I do understand the logic, and I just hadn't heard it framed in that way. Um, saying goodbye to you guys. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being a follower of the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast. We've had a good time with you tonight, and we're already looking forward to the next episode talking to you about catching more fish more often. See you. Fisherman's Post.